Hello, everyone, and welcome to another very timely installment of Club Moffat Talks. Uh, for most of you, our last episode went live maybe a month ago. For us, it's been like six months since we recorded, and it is a very special episode because we're here with another Halloween entry. Uh, and we are joined today by Cody Parrish. Hey, y'all. How's it going? Very excited to have you again here, Cody. I know that uh, you just recently moved. You've been uh, getting some really cool stuff going on with you. And against all odds, we've got you here uh, just in the nick of time. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, I wasn't sure we had talked about this before. And I, and I wasn't sure if we if it was going to actually, you know, take place. Because, you know, once we moved to Colorado Springs, um, you know, it was one of those things where we had to we're going to have to reach out and send an email or, or make a phone call or something. So it kind well, of threw everything off. Actually, uh, about a month ago, I did go and try to look you up. And everything I found from uh, from your Twitter accounts to to any online search I did, I you were always uh, still here in Wichita Falls. I even looked you up <laughs> in uh, uh, Colorado Springs. That you're you're at the University of uh, Colorado, Colorado Springs. Is, is that what you're at? Yes. Yeah. University of Colorado, Colorado when Springs. I, when yeah. I looked it up, you were not in their directory at all. No. Yeah. Uh, we had hired so many new people here as I think every university was, is kind of dealing with um, a mass sort of uh, rehiring phase, but yeah, we had hired so many people that there was just a, a huge backlog. I just now got a profile on uh, the webpage with like a picture and everything. So two months in, two and a wow. half. Wow. <laughs> That's impressive. So, I think it took me a little while to get one here, I believe, but that's uh i think we have uh, fewer um fewer options than colorado springs probably does as well yeah yeah but we we hired i think just in like the month of july or august alone like 70 new people and then it's just been going ever since and like um our department just got fully staffed our uh I, i'm i'm with uccs lead in the chancellor's leadership class um but we are housed within student life here and um, our whole department uh, is almost completely new. I think there's like maybe three out of the eight pro staff here who uh, are returning, but everyone else has only been here for, you know, two and a half, three months. Wow. That's, that's crazy. Especially that many people. Yeah, I know it's nuts, but it seems like that's what all universities are dealing with. I know MSU, um, you know, had some hiring that they were doing as well. Don't y'all have some new librarians? Yeah, we hired three new people. Uh, and as far as the new librarians, they're actually old people, old employees that we've all promoted to a librarian, including someone called Chris, Chris DiPanetta. I don't know if you've heard of that guy. He's been promoted to a librarianship now. Oh, I have it. No, that's <laughs> awesome. Okay, well, great. Yeah, that makes it a little bit easier. It makes the training not uh, so so tedious and you know extensive. Well, the training I'm doing now is still schoolwork. Everyone here knows, like every, anyone who's listened to this podcast knows that I complain about it uh, incessantly, but that's that's the <laughs> training I'm doing right now. But uh, oh, oh, I should I should go back. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, Club Moffat Talks. Uh, I am your host, Chris DiPanetta, instruction librarian. Oh, that's what you, so it's you. <laughs> It's you that Ryan was talking about. Yes. <laughs> For me. some reason, I thought that it was someone whose name was Christy. Christy, like, uh, oh. Christy Panetta? Yeah, Christy. Yeah. <laughs> someone literally called me that the other day. I can't remember what it was from, but they, they actually referred to me as Christy for a little <laughs> while. And I was like, no. Mm -mm. <laughs> no. Well, congrats, Chris. That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Cody. Ryan <laughs> is now our uh, associate librarian of public services, so... A lot of people got bumped up. Great. That's awesome. And I'm sure at some point we'll probably have on our new media, or not media, our, our marketing coordinator, uh, Tasia. She's been just nonstop moving since she got here. So she's, she's doing a great job of, of getting uh, more more public eyes and more little programs that, that we uh, probably wouldn't have been doing otherwise. Like Band Book Week, she put up a big thing out in the front and it looked really nice. So... That's yeah, great. things are changing around here. Good, good. That's awesome. Changes, change is good. It's one of those things where, like, um, I remember when when COVID began. Um, I, I was talking with the chair of the English department, and she was saying that uh, 
she saw this as an opportunity for growth. And at the time, of course, I was really nervous. Uh, I think all of us were, um, but I've realized that that is a, a really good way of looking at it. Change as you know, unsettling and uncomfortable as it can be, it also is a super good opportunity to try new things and to grow the department. It is certainly a, a, an optimistic way of looking at a, a killer virus, but um, yes, <laughs> I, I think I think though in the long run, I do think that that is a, a, a very good way of looking at it. And as we've seen, like we've changed a lot of things, especially in the way that we're approaching like workshops and, and instruction yes. and stuff. We're we're integrating a lot more, uh, a, a lot more online and and distance elements than we have in the past, and it's actually working yes. out quite well for us. We, we've actually gotten more people coming to our workshops. Uh, virtually than we have in person and, and that's kind of new and exciting and scary in its own way yes it's it's scary let me get this back on track change <laughs> is scary segue is that a segue i think it is i think it's a segue into us talking about our topic here for our halloween special horror just like we did last time but i think we're I think we've got a little bit of a more focused track because last time we were just we started to do the episode and then we went into uh hey what's your favorite horror thing and and then it was just rambling but now <laughs> i've got an idea kind of it's a good idea it's a good one i'm, I'm excited for it so what i want to talk about is rather than the talking about like movies or books or something specific that scares us but i really want to uh, touch on i i wrote a blog about this on i think this blog is dead now but i wrote uh about this topic before about um what is it like what is it actually that makes a good horror story mm. what are the yeah. elements that that really stick with you for something outside of just like of course we have things that are funny scary or things that are like exciting scary but then there are there are the things that stick with us that just that you can't really put your finger on and mm -hmm. i've got some ideas myself about about what these things are but i want to really hear from the two of you about what it is that you think that creates a, an atmosphere or a, a story or something that just has stayed with you yeah um that's when I, I really like this idea because it it can go in so many directions. Um, one thing that I always think of when I think of, you know, what makes good horror is what's the purpose of horror? What is it trying to accomplish? And, it, it, you know, the first thing that came to mind when Ryan uh, sent me this, I, the idea that you had um, was the Stephen King quote. Of course, it's always Stephen King. Um, but uh he says, um, and I don't, I don't, I don't remember if this was in uh, Dance Macabre or if this was in On Writing, um, but he said, I recognize terror as the finest emotion. And so I try to terrorize the reader. But if I find that I can't terrify, I'll try to horrify. And if I find that I can't horrify, I'll go for the gross out. I'm not proud. Um, but uh, I think that in a lot of ways, you know, looking at it in that you know, perspective, that's kind of how I think of, you know, what makes good horror is something that is, you know, hyper-focused on either uh, terrifying the, the audience, horrifying them, grossing them out, um, you know, that kind of thing. I'll go one step for, or further. Um, I'll, I'll build off that idea. I think one of the things that's unique about horror is it, of course, it builds off of fear. All good art yeah. is, is, is playing off the ideas of various types of emotions. And mm -hmm. I think fear is the one emotion that we have so little self-reflection on to some extent. Um, we usually know what makes us happy. We are usually aware of what makes us angry or the fact we are angry. Fear is something that I think um, a lot of us don't, don't think about, don't try, to, don't try to realize or deal with. So it's, it's an, the one emotion that we have kind of the most... So less the, the least amount of self-reflection in uh, and the awareness of our own fears. And I think that's why horror is so powerful is because that's a lot of times that's what horror is making us do. It's making us face our own fears or making us realize, oh, wow, I'm really afraid of that. Yeah. And to that point, I mean, it's one of those things where like 
you know, there's there's probably good reason why we haven't thought about this very much because horror is uncomfortable. No one really wants to sit down and and think about what makes them afraid. I think that's why so many people, um, you know, maybe don't enjoy or claim they don't enjoy horror films or maybe don't actively seek them out or seek out like horror novels or comics or, you know, experiences that will, uh, you know, elicit their own fear because you have to be willing to deal with that discomfort. And that's not easy. You know, since you brought up a quote and obviously Stephen King's the one that you can't beat and you can't uh, get away from, um, my favorite horror product project anything ever is uh silent hill 2 the video game oh uh, man yes and, well there we go <laughs> um <laughs> and, and i wanted to bring up this quote that this is one that and it's this first sentence that really has always stuck with me when it comes to horror but i'm going to read the whole thing off uh one of the producers or maybe it's the director uh takayoshi, takayoshi sato said um psychological horror has to shake a human's heart deeply mm. that's something it's just that's how better of a of a way to describe horror as something that shakes you yes uh, to, to continue on with that uh, and they're referring to sexuality because silent hill 2 that's a big theme of it uh to continue he says shaking people's hearts deeply means uncovering people's core emotions and their core motivation for life everybody is thinking and concerning about sex and death everything if we want to scare shake or touch the users or spectators then we have to think about sex and death deeply to make a death scene somebody died or a monster died and we tried to mix an erotic essence into it this is kind of a visual and a core concept so there they're talking about we we wanted to shake people and our main theme is something that's a core component of life so what other way to shake someone than to add in something that's not supposed to be scary? And that's just one element of the themes of Silent Hill, but uh, that those first few sentences of something that shakes you deeply, I can't think of a better way to describe horror. Yeah, I think you're spot on because that's, I mean, you're right. Horror, when it's, when it's effective it gets right down to your bone. I mean, I, I love it when I, I love it and I hate it. When I go into um, uh, a movie and, or I'm reading a book and when I exit the theater or when I put the book down, like I'm, I'm physically shaking because that's how I know like it's, it's hit me at a visceral level. And that's how you know it's a, it's a good, effective uh, piece of storytelling. Oh, absolutely. And that doesn't have to be horror, but I feel like horror is the one that really, <clears throat> horror is the one that when you're done with it, you need to process your emotions and you need to really think about what it is that you just experienced rather than coming out and just kind of talking about it or, or feeling out what you, what you experience. With horror, you really have to figure out why did that shake me so much? Why did that horrify me where something that was a lesser story or something that wasn't as scary maybe wouldn't have affected me so much. Yeah. Yeah. Again, yeah I, I think mean, that's, that's going back yeah. to what I was saying, because if you finish a book and you're in a good mood, you know, you don't have to think about it. If you finish a book and you're really sad because it was a sad ending, you don't have to think about it. If you finish a book and you're angry, you might have to think about why am I so angry about this ending? But it, it, it's true. Most of almost any horror book, if you finish it and you're afraid, you have to sit there and go, what was it that made me so afraid of this? What, you know, so I think there is a lot of self-reflection. Um, I think, again, it, that that idea that um, it's well, again, let me throw in a quote. You guys get two quotes. Let me do a quote. <laughs> this one is from I, I'm going to go a little old school. This is from a guy called Howard Philip Lovecraft. Uh, and he, mm. I'm going to paraphrase because I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but I think it's something along the lines of uh, the greatest of all emotions is fear. And the greatest of all fears is the fear of the unknown. Is the fear of the unknown. Mm. I've heard that one myself. And, and yeah. I, I adore that quote. Uh, I didn't remember if it was him. I didn't remember what the quote was until just now, but that's one that I, that always sticks with me as well. Yeah. Well, and one thing about, about fear and horror is horror almost, I mean, yes, it confronts you with your fear, but that's the 
that's kind of the unique sort of trick of, of horror is like it, when you're scared, you can't help but keep thinking about what it is that's scaring you because it, it like haunts you when you've had a nightmare, if you've read a really good book and, you know, uh, like I remember when I read Misery, um, Stephen King's Misery, and I was, I was so um, invested in the character and, and wrapped up in, in the character that by the end of it, I was feeling the same like catatonic sort of shaken nervousness that the character was feeling. And it wouldn't, you know, the best horror stories don't let go. They, you know, that's what keeps you up at night. And so they kind of force the reflection, Brian, that you were talking about. It's also, though, it's also a reflection of society, too, because yes, I think um, the horror in the next few years is going to reflect a lot about what's going on with COVID right now, to some extent. I, don't, I have no idea how it's going to manifest itself, but it's interesting. But you and me talked um, a few months ago about all of these new horror films that are coming out that are focusing on the fear of parenthood and how yes. that's something that both the millennials and the Gen Zers have this deep fear of being a parent, and that's starting to pop up in some of the, the horror stuff that we're seeing. And if you go back to something like the Victorians, it's it's a fear of sex and independent women. That's what Dracula mm -hmm. is. It's basically, it's a fear <laughs> of women making their own decisions and being sexual. That's the greatest fear. Oh, and, and the evil immigrants coming to our country and making our women independent thinkers and sexual. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. There's also a, a, I, I, I keep going back to this thing that you uh, that you did before Cody, a, a presentation that I saw you do about um, the the eighties, the slasher horror mm -hmm. genre, and how unique it was to that time. Yeah, because before then, like like murder and and these violent crimes, they weren't really stuff that the public had much knowledge about. But starting in like the late sixties, the seventies, and that era when the the serial killer started to become more of a common phenomenon phenomenon mm -hmm. phenomenon <laughs> that's when when the movie started to take kind of control of that image that's when it be, that's when it went from uh, a local fear like oh there's something wrong happening in my town or my neighborhood or whatever to a a national one it's something that really grabbed uh, i would i would almost say like the not really a shot maybe not shot in freud that's not the word i'm looking for the zeitgeist of yeah horror. it's like I suddenly mean, nobody's safe yeah I, I would definitely say obviously like there are there are aspects of horror that were you know sort of collective national fears before then but the thing starting with psycho um and psycho was you know influenced by the ed gein story and um you know, Psycho kind of brought this idea of the murderer next door. Um, so in a way it was local, but it, it was a national thing because Ed, the Ed Gein story was so shocking um, that, you know, everyone across the U.S. knew about it. But it was one of those things where all of a sudden now everyone had to look to their left and right and ask, is, is my neighbor doing that? Like, is, you know... Or if, if I like walked into my neighbor's house, would I find the gruesome, you know, discovery that that those police officers did when they investigated, you know, the phone call? Would would I find the person in the in the back uh, shed strung up and dressed like a deer? I mean, it was just one of those things where, you know, and then, of course, as you pointed out, like that got taken and started, you know, uh, being run with. And and uh, we had. Um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Black Christmas, um, and it, and the slasher kind of came to sort of its its fullest formation or most uh, realized formation with Halloween, and then the eighties just ran with that. But part of the slasher uh, film that I think resonated beyond sort of the the idea of the localized you know human as as the monster serial killer was the idea of you know, the, the common trope sex equals death um, in the 80s and the late 70s, we were starting to see a, a pushback against the sort of liberalism of, of the 60s and 70s and, and all the different social movements and social unrest. And so in the 80s, we had, um, you know, with, with the ascendance of Reagan into, um, you know, the Oval Office, we had this 
um, you know, return, so to speak, to uh, uh, moral values of the 50s. And so then it was, you know, by intention or not, you start seeing all these people and these young adults who are, you know, not being responsible, having sex, doing drugs, cussing, all kinds of things, um, you know, end up getting killed by these, you know, uh, slasher, immortal slasher villains like Jason and, and Freddie and Michael Myers. Jason Voorhees, arch conservative. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's the thing about that, though. That's what makes that so, so kind of insidious is that the characters are not displaying these traditional values, but they're not being like, they're not being killed by someone who opposes them. They're being murdered or, or stalked or harassed by someone who embodies like an, a, a distance from all of that. It's someone who doesn't have that sort of really care for, for what the values are. It's like an omniscient type of, of judge or executioner. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of like a, an embodiment of a moral compass that is supposed to exact a sort of judgment, like you said. Is that part of good horror, though? Because you go back to something like the old Grimm's fairy tales, which were moral lessons saying, you know, if you do these things, you will survive. If you do these things, you will be you'll be killed in horrible ways type of idea. Yeah, I mean, that's a good a good point. Like horror always or it has a history and a tradition of being didactic. Um, I don't know if, uh, if I would say that it's, that's the mark of a good horror film, but I definitely think that it's, it's within the tradition and there have been a, or a good horror story. And I think that there's a lot of good horror stories that end up being didactic. Some, uh, you know, newer horror, uh, tries that, um, but I think that they go for more amb ambiguity. Um, I, it seems like, like I'm thinking like it follows in the new one lamb um, definitely went the ambiguous route though. I think you could pull some clear messages about what it was saying about what the character, the character's actions and, you know, whether they were punished or not. And, and for listeners who were who are unaware, because I had to look this up myself because I'm dumb, uh, didactic <laughs> means it's it's like a moral tale. It's something that's intended to teach or, or instruct or, yes. or give some sort of guidance. Yeah. So like in, in fairy tales at the end, you would have, um, depending on the translation, it would have like, uh, and the author, um, though they're all, you know, oral traditions, but like if it's Perot or, or the Grimm's brothers, whoever it may be. Um, they might have this little section that says like lesson, and this is the takeaway, you know, and then you read the takeaway from the story. Um, so yeah, that would be, and, and didacticism is usually more explicit. Um, uh, whereas a lot of horror films these days aren't necessarily that much. Like I'll, I'll tell you one example of one that it's not really a horror film, but it's a Halloween film, Huey Halloween. <laughs> it's an Adam Sandler film. Oh, so no. Take it for what it's worth. <laughs> but but um, yeah, it, it's basically like a, an anti-bullying film uh, at its core. And so it comes across as much more didactic because, you know, they have this moment where like these bullies are confronted and they have to explain why it is that they bullied, you know, I don't want to give too much away, but bullied a certain person. And, uh, you know, and then it's basically like bullying bad. And it's like, okay, this works for, for, you know, a younger audience, but for adults and teenagers, it's a little too on the nose. So um, I would say, yeah, like I said, it's, it's within the tradition. I don't know if didacticism is necessary for a good uh, horror story, but usually there is some message about some sort of behavior and a sort of moral compass that's there. I would argue not because I have a different, um, I think, I think I have a different um, viewpoint of, of the core of horror. And, yeah. it, and it comes from that thing about about shaking someone in that it's horror has to present a tension that mm -hmm. can't be dealt with by normal means. Yeah. And, and that doesn't just include like, you know, monsters or, or whatever. And it, it, obviously those are the easy ways to do it. Those are the easy ways to present horror elements is to have them in a, a supernatural light. 
but I mean, something something that I always go back to, one of my favorite horror things ever is The Shining. Mm-hmm. Uh, and whether or not you're looking at The Shining from the book or the movie or whatever, the horror behind it is that someone who's intimate in your life turns on you. Yeah. And in the case of The Shining, they, they turn, you know, Jack Torrance turns on the family in the most horrific way possible. Mm-hmm. And that's where the tension really comes from is, is Jack's uh, hostility towards his family before the point where it goes into him becoming a literal axe murderer. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and that makes me think of um, uh, like, you know, obviously a lot of horror has to deal with like a sort of helplessness um, or a, a word like maybe a concern of not being able to um you know, secure your own safety. And I think of, there's this one, I'm wondering if y'all have heard of it. There's this book, it was self-published by um, Darren, Dathan, Dathan Auerbach. It's called Pin Pal. And it is amazing. It's such a good, it's one of the only books that I've read as an adult that still scared me and creeped me out. Um, but the whole premise of this book is there's this person who is, you know, the main character is an adult and he's looking back, like reflecting on his life as a child and growing up and sort of unraveling this mystery that becomes absolutely horrifying. And um, I don't really want to say too much because if you read it, it's incredible. And the less you know, the better. But it's more about the lack of control that this person had very little control over the events that were occurring in his life. And there was no safety. Like childhood is usually thought of as like the safe place. Um, you know, and, and we think of children as in need of protection and he did not have it. And so there is in that sense, um, less about like what you can do, but about what you can't do and sort of that terror that comes with that. Having child characters as, as like the, the embodiment of, of helplessness, that's something that Stephen King does really well too. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. Like I mentioned, The Shining, obviously, Danny, that's, you know, he's like the most popular child character in all of horror. But then there's also, I, I can't even remember his name, but there's a little boy in uh, Salem's Lot, mm. which which I, I mentioned the, the last time we did this, this horror thing as well. But th- there is an element of, yeah, childhood is supposed to be a time when you're carefree, when you're innocent, when when people are protecting you because you can't protect yourself and I, and I think there's something yeah. to be said about that 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 little nugget of truth there where it's like oh of course I'm safe because they, I have people around me who are protecting me uh-huh and then there's you know no one no one wants to say but what if you don't yeah yeah and, and, Steve, and, go ahead no I was I'm done that was yeah it. so Stephen King um one thing that's interesting is is he does have uh, some of his most well-known works um, feature these children, but, uh, and, and he is um, by his own admission, uh, very much like subscribes to the idea of the romantic child. So there are certain constructs of children that we've seen throughout history. And um, the romantic child is probably the most uh, pervasive um, especially within the U.S., and this, this is it's what you were already talking about, Chris. The idea that children are pure, they're innocent, their minds are a blank slate. We need to protect them. Adults are supposed to, um, you know, children uh, as they grow up, they're corrupted by adult thinking and the world, and so it's it's incumbent upon adults to rear them and protect that blank slate and make sure that the only things that go on to that blank slate, aka their mind are, you know, positive things. And Stephen King has admitted that his children, he believes in the romantic child. He doesn't like uh, seeing children as evil, um, which you see in some of the late seventies horror novels that seem to be a trend. Um, Like John Saul uh, uh, wrote a book called Suffer the Children. And if you read Stephen King's uh, uh, stories, a lot of them 
um, he, he ha- or he has very few that feature evil children. One um, is actually, it's a short story called Suffer the Little Children, and it is dark. Well, that's a creepy um, little one. Yes, that one is about um, a, a teacher who is uh, older and she's p- known for being pretty ruthless in terms of um, uh, punishment. And uh, she starts believing that her child, her her students are um, like aliens um, that, ha- or they've been sort of, um, was it like possessed by by aliens? And she goes crazy and ends up doing some pretty shocking things to the children. Um, but that was one of the only stories that Stephen King wrote where children are are meant to be malevolent. But yeah, by and large, uh, his books are about romantic children who end up actually being pretty strong um, while helpless. Like Danny is, is helpless to an extent, but he also has the, the shine, the ability to, you know, see what the, the hotel is doing and in his own way kind of manipulate that. Um, and then in, in it, possibly the most well-known example of, of the King children, um, they end up having the gift of imagination, which is something that Stephen King kind of implies is unique to childhood that we lose that as we, as we age. And so, um, you know, his, his uh, children can see Pennywise and all the horrible things that are happening in Derry because they still can imagine things. And as they age, they lose that, that core, um, you know, ability that, that we only get as children, or at least Stephen King sort of uh, implies. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, horror, that is one thing that we often see is, is the, is the child in there. Um, and a lot of times it's romanticized one that's really good. Uh, a movie that's really good where they're not romanticized is um, a Christmas horror film called um, better watch out. It's Australian. And that is amazing. Really? Okay. <clears throat> I'm always on the lookout for good Christmas horror movies. I mean, like the one that I that I can only ever go to is Krampus. Yeah, and, this one and, is like a mix of Home Alone. Like it's clearly playing off of Home Alone, but it's kind of like, what if the wealthy, like upper middle class kid is actually not like a saint? Hmm. What if he's bad? Um, and And I may have just revealed a little bit too much, but um, it is fantastic. But that that is interesting about having the the that kind of child character because, like you said in it, the reason why Pennywise is after children is because they have that imagination and they can be scared to such an extent. Yeah, that makes them the perfect target for for him because he feeds off of fear. But it's that mm-hmm. same imagination that allows them to fight off that fear. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, um, I, I'm sure you're aware of this film because it's uh, John Carpenter, but uh, there's, well, this this is actually a book that I'm talking about, but the film is based on it. There's a novel from the 50s called The Mid the Midditch, Midwitch, Midditch? Uh, Cuckoos. <laughs> uh, it's, it's adapted into two different films called Village of the Damned. Oh, yeah. And, and the idea for those is that the form of children is maybe more what we consider to be the the innocent aspect it's because they're small and they're helpless mm. but but in this story it's that they're horrifying aliens <laughs> uh, and it's just that because they have that appearance that's that it it unarms and it and it shocks and leaves I don't know the main characters it leaves the adults to to be more helpless because what do you do about that when yeah, that's I mean, what threat. it says about the 50s and 60s I mean you have probably starting with the bad seed and then you have the, mm-hmm. the Mitch uh, cuckoos you have the omen you have the exorcist what is, yeah what do they say about kids during that period of time I mean, it says that that parents did not trust their kids, that they thought, especially once the hippie movement got underway, yeah. like with the exorcist and the omen, parents thought, oh, my God, these kids are, you know, 
they're prone to being, you know, influenced by the devil. Uh, we can't trust them, you know, uh, and that's the other part of the, you know, there's the sinful child construct or the evil child construct that says the opposite, that kids, that children, um, and it's definitely rooted in a sort of traditional uh, view of religion, um, Judeo-Christian uh, religion, where um, children are, are necessarily uh, evil, um, we're born into sin, that kind of thing. And so we have to be reared by adults who know better to be uh, good. And so, yeah, evil seed is like a perfect example of that. Um, it, well, it's also a very, very old idea, too. I mean, uh, the Midwich Cuckoos is building up the idea of the changeling, the idea mm. that um, the, the, the fae would come into the house and steal the baby away and replace it with one of their own to pretend to be a child. Mm. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting, interesting idea. I haven't even seen the bad seed. I need to. I mean, it was, it was wildly successful in the 50s. It spawned the book spawned uh, lots of plays, a movie. Yeah. One thing that we, you know, Ryan, you've touched on and we've touched on a, a few times now, um, you know, in the sense of like what makes good horror. And, and I wanted to ask y'all, do we do y'all agree? believe or agree that good horror necessarily has um social commentary or does that social commentary have to be clear yeah what do y'all think about that uh no uh, <laughs> no i think that it helps and i think that it certainly can uh, encapsulate the the fears and and maybe the anxieties of of what's happening with Zeitgeist, that society at the time, yeah. but I don't believe that it's necessary. Like my favorite horror movies are are usually ones that have more of a family drama to them, or or mm. some kind of character drama, not necessarily one that is uh, that that is based on what's happening at the time, but something that's universal. I think, like I said, Silent gotcha. Hill Two is my favorite horror thing ever. That's about a man looking for his dead wife and that uses traditions like uh like the the main one the one that that is commonly associated with that game is the tale of orpheus it's the uh. traveling into a hellish other world uh in order to find something that's close to you but ruining that closeness because you can't trust it because sense. because your your anxiety of going into this horrifying other place i think um horror again is a reflection of personal fears those personal fears can come about through like the zeitgeist society fears of the time but they can also be much more specific to that writer um, mm -hmm. um i think uh, both are valid i mean obviously the ones that touch on the zeitgeist tend to be wildly more popular and they tend to have lots more um probably uh, a lot more um, similar types of stories told over and over again during a certain time period, as we've mentioned. But I think ultimately, I think all writers tend to tap into that, um, to some sort of personal fear, at least good ones do, and directors tap into that, that personal fear somehow that, they, that they've experienced themselves and, and present it to the audience. I think when I watch, oh, go ahead, Chris. Oh, well, I, I was going to, I was going to break up another quote. Um, because this one's kind of becoming a meme these days and it's from uh, my, one of my favorite directors ever probably my favorite film director ever uh david lynch ah where uh he was in an interview and said uh, believe it or not eraserhead is my most spiritual film and when people mm. think of eraserhead they think of the creepy skin baby uh <laughs> screaming and yeah. and loud mechanical noises and and like really horrifying sexual imagery um but his his response to it is that for him it was spiritual and that's because he was just becoming a father and that was mm. one of the big driving forces behind it was his anxiety about becoming a father and um kind of the humorous part of that interview is the the interviewer says oh elaborate on that and he just kind of flatly says no <laughs> and they move on but that's the kind of thing that when i think about like what is at the core of a, of a horror story it's something like that it's something that's spiritual and it's something that that comes from a place that i mean you know 
I'm I'm gonna be a I'm gonna be a dad just like <laughs> not to say I'm just like David Lynch or anything. <laughs> But I'm also going to have a baby girl here in a few months, and I'm pretty terrified about that. I don't know that I could quite put it into the the same kind of uh, imagery that David Lynch did with with the racer head. But at the same time, it's something that I can. I when I first watched that film, I had one vision of what it was about. When I watched it a few years ago again, it, it kind of stuck out as something a little more like a general anxiety thing. And now I'm seeing it as you know that that fear of of and having an intimate position kind of foisted upon you yeah i mean i this makes me think of another thing as i was trying to come up with like what i sort of defined as the conventions of good horror um it made me think of character development like good horror for me has always had characters i can invest in like it, it takes its time with that um and unfortunately not all horror does that, but I really enjoy it when they do because then it does feel so much more personal. Uh, again, one of the things that I think about is the first chapter of the new It adaptations, um, It Chapter One. Um, it was written by, and I always get his last name wrong. I can never remember what it is. Uh, Kerry Fukunawa, Fukunaga, I can't remember. He did True Detective. Um, I'll look it up. Uh, Kerry Fukunaga. Okay. Um, and he spent like two years of his life writing that script because he was initially going to uh, direct it. And I feel like, you know, and then he, he left the project because of creative differences. The, the studio didn't want it to be so focused on characters. It wanted it to have more jump scares. It wanted to be more mainstream. And so he said, look, I can't do that. Like, I'm, I'm going to leave this. And so he did. And that's why Andy Muschietti's version has more jump scares. Um, but I think the thing that sticks to me about it, not just the adaptation, but also Stephen King's novel, is that the, you invest so much time in the characters that like, they feel you can see part of yourself in them. And that, you know, going to your point about um, you know, feeling sort of like a, a personal a connection and, and it's on a very individual level. I think that that really helps when it's good, you know, well-written characters. Something that I think we've touched on last time in our last Halloween episode, and and you're you're starting to make me come back to this a lot, actually. And, and I actually kind of hate this this phrase, but people consider or have considered before the horror genre as elevated drama yes as as a way to like legitimize horror as a fictional genre but that that does so much disservice to what horror is and what it has been culturally mm -hmm. since the dawn of of literature since the dawn of storytelling yes i am so glad you brought this up because that was kind of where I was thinking of going with the idea of the social commentary. Um, because we, you know, by all accounts, we're sort of experiencing what many have called a horror renaissance. And we have been experiencing this since 2015. Um, it sort of started with The Witch and, well, not, it really started with It Follows. Yeah. And then It Comes at Night. And then uh, the witch and the Babadook. And then it just kind of went from there. And we've seen this incredible out, output of just really great horror films. And um, instead of placing the emphasis on just like strong writing and whatnot, uh, you know, we have, and, and I looked it up beforehand, Steve Rose, I think he was the person who coined the, who started this sort of debate. Uh, he writes for the guardian and he wrote an article in 2017 um, sort of suggesting that we are in this new phase of post horror. And then after that, John Krasinski uh, famously uh, discussed elevated horror. And um, that, that kind of started this whole debate about, you know, just what you were saying about how like, 
is this a, you know, a denigrative term um, to uh, imply that only recent horror is valuable or good? So I'm really curious to hear more of y'all's thoughts on this. Well, let me jump in here. One thing that's interesting when you're talking about this, you mentioned 2015. If you talk about the period just before what you're calling the new renaissance of horror, it was really a deconstruction period for horror. You had things like Cabin in the Woods. You had things like, um, oh, I forget the name of it, the one about the um, the uh, the documentary team that's following a serial killer around. Yeah, had, um, The Rise of Leslie Byrne and Behind yeah, the Mask. Yeah. Uh, you had Scream, which probably started this, this whole trend. But it's interesting because one of the things that all those movies have in common is they make fun of the tropes, especially like the archetype tropes. But, you know, everyone fits in a neat little archetype and how that really doesn't work and how that's kind of shoddy, um, a, a form of shoddy um, writing to some extent. So I think one of the reasons you're having this renaissance now is because the, the horror movies we see between like um, 96 and let's say 2016 we're really kind of making fun of the horror genre. They're saying, here's all the things that are wrong with the horror genre. And that and I think that helped elevate, elevate it and point it in better directions so that the stuff that's coming out now doesn't follow back upon the easy tropes or the easy archetypes that had been used before in the past. I, I think the problem there also is that it was a, it was a response to how uh, formulaic horror had become. Because up until that point, I mean, it's, you know, I mentioned Eraserhead. That's a movie from the 70s. We talk mm -hmm. about the, the slasher movies and how they were actually quite quite unique for their time. Um, you know, we, we talk about all these things. And then in the late 90s, early 2000s, you start to get into the, the deconstruction. But you also get into the, the blockbuster horror film. You know, yeah, the ones yeah. like, uh, I don't know what, The Conjuring, I guess. Uh, mm. Saw, those those really huge movies that are uh um, well you had that also in the 80s too oh yeah. of course no not to say that we didn't but with with that it, it's almost like horror lost its voice but rather than just being like the the auteur horror that we're seeing now i i also think that it's also because of the rise in really cheap uh micro not, not exactly like um like poorly made horror but being able to effectively make horror movies on a lower budget uh, yeah the micro budget horror film blumhouse is specializing in that oh definitely and and i'm thinking you know we i i just said that the franchise horror is not what i'm thinking of but like paranormal activity is one that i go back to as a like the cheapest you could possibly make a horror film yeah and that first one is really really good yes yeah um so let me i i'll just chime in with with a little bit here so um just some history i guess on the development of horror cinema um with with horror cinema there there are sort of until now there were sort of two golden ages that they had they had the golden age in the 30s where you had Dracula, Frankenstein, you know, uh, Wolfman came a little bit later, but the mummy, um, the universal monsters. And then the second golden age was the late sixties, um, really starting with Rosemary's baby and going all the way up until uh, Halloween and Dawn of the dead. Um, and then the eighties, I agree with you, Chris, there, the, a lot, the eighties has an enormous and very diverse output of horror films. The slasher film was pretty unique. It just got, um, over, I guess, like reproduced. Um, They're the easiest to make. Yeah. Um, but the eighties is actually generally regarded by a lot of horror critics and scholars as like a time of decline, which I don't really agree with. Um, but they sort of view it as a time of decline. And then, and, and then we had some, some different kind of things happening. So the eighties, you had the slasher film, and then you had the Neo slasher film, which is basically just the supernatural slasher that began with, um, uh, a nightmare on Elm street. And then it, um, it basically, you know, Ryan, you were talking about the, the parody kind of cycle. And so, uh, a lot of scholars kind of the common sort of phrases, they say like, you know that a genre or a, a trend has reached its end when you start seeing parodies of it. Mm -hmm. And so um, by the, the end of the 80s, camp, 
parodies were just taking over slasher films. And then um, in uh, the early 90s, you saw uh, a lot of black uh, uh, horror films that focused on um, the uh, black community's experiences. And these were directed by black horror uh, maker, horror filmmakers, which was sort of a new shift um, not all of them. Of course, Candyman was directed by uh, a British uh, white man, um, Bernard Rose. But um, you had like Tales from the Hood um, and uh, one that I can't remember, but it had Snoop Dogg in it and some other stuff. But um, oh, yeah, it then, was about a, a dead uh, pimp, I think, or something like that. Yeah. Um, kind of riffing off of black exploitation in some instances uh, in the 70s. But so by the, the, the mid to late 90s, Scream ushered in. Um, the uh like the postmodern slasher where it was very much um like a lot of meta commentary riffing on itself on its conventions um but they they don't usually consider that the end of of a genre they consider it they consider scream to almost kind of be creating its own little trend there and then you also had a rise of um, sort of remakes of the castle films from the 50s mm-hmm. um, at the end of the of the millennium um, or at the turn of the millennium and so it's kind of a lot of people call it the return to the graveyard and then you had um, torture porn um, oh. as it was pejoratively called which was begun um, by saw and and post 9 11 horror is kind of what they discuss with the found footage trend and oh, the yeah. slasher remake trend and so they a lot of people say that cabin in the woods um and like dale and tucker versus evil and some of these other kind of parodies were really not making fun of slasher films but they were reacting to the remake cycle Mm. and so they were saying that the remake cycle has really if it ever uh you know there's a debate about its its value but if it was ever valuable it's reached the end of that by the late two you know after Friday the 13th and a nightmare on Elm street in 2009 and 2010, respectively, they were like, this is done. We need to move on. One thing that, that we know about horror uh, just in general is that the best horror comes out of times of social unrest. That's, you know, the sixties and seventies time of great social unrest in the U S. Um, and we had the best horror films come out of that. Um, right now, I think that there's p- pretty clear evidence that, uh, especially with uh, President or ex former President Trump's and um, you know tenure, that saw this huge output of very creative horror films reacting to a lot of the the social unrest that was sort of stemming from that election. So that's kind of what what seems to be going on here. Um, and then, of course, with the nostalgia zeitgeist, there's a lot of turning to the past, which, again, you, we can say, you know, uh, President Trump's campaign was built on returning to the Reagan era, which was built on ret- which in turn was built on returning to the 50s. So the 50s, of course, was about returning to this imaginary um, American ideals of like the 1910s, which really didn't exist. Yeah. 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 So it's all a a sort of like nostalgic cycle. Um, And so uh, in this turn back, we've had a lot of resistance to that. Get out is a great one. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, us uh, does some of that. And then we've just had just, you know, some incredible films that are just really ingenious, Um, you know, in terms of like what they do with sound, like a quiet place and hush. Um, and what they do with just playing on old tropes and trying to create something new. I think that we were ready for something else because the 2000s with the remake cycle, especially, and so much like just being inundated with found footage films, you know, as good as Cloverfield and Paranormal Activity were, I think we were just ready for something different. Yeah, I was ready for a tripod when I saw all those movies. (laughs) Uh, I I needed to like sit down while I watched them. Study cam, huh? (laughs) <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> but you know i'm looking up like i just googled like hey 80s horror what's some good 80s horror movies and just looking at some of these i'm just astounded like this if there is ever any doubt that this was the best generation or one of the best generations for horror then uh, i i think that listing off some of these titles would would put that to rest um a nightmare on elm street friday yeah. the 13th 
Yeah. Hellraiser. Oh God. Gremlins, <laughs> The Shining, Ghostbusters, uh-huh. The Thing, The Blob, mm-hmm. Scanners. Mm-hmm. Videodrome. Videodrome. Oh yeah. A little shop of horrors. And some of these are remakes, but they're oh, they live. Aliens, uh-huh. Predator. Yeah. Like oh the fly. Yeah. Some of these might be remakes, but they're they're from the point of view of an auteur of someone who has something they want to say mm-hmm. i mean so how many how many of those of movies from that that wonderful era in the 30s and 40s was um scientists sitting in a giant room not saying anything and the the monsters are uh, uh analogous to communism yes yes that's the 1950s yeah yeah (laughs) so so even though they might be remakes of those products they still have their own voice they have their own unique directorial vision yeah it makes me think of the remake of dawn of the dead the 2004 Zack snyder one Mm -hmm. and i know that at the time it, it wasn't well regarded but since then a lot of uh critics have returned to it and been like wow this actually because what it was doing, it was commenting on um, the war on terror. And mm-hmm. instead of making it solely about, you know, capitalism and sort of the mindless consumers that we become, it was about, you know, terrorism and terrorists and who is terrorizing who. And, you know, it did some stuff that, you know, as you pointed out, like a remake can put its own twist on something and make it relevant. Um, but yeah, I don't know. One thing that, that I really like about horror films, and I think Mark is a mark of a really good one, is sort of an air of mystery with an opportunity for discovery. And a lot of times this discovery, you know, it might be like, who's the killer? Or what's the monster? But usually in making that discovery, we find out something about ourselves. Um, and it makes me think of light and shadow. Um, Freud's idea of the uncanny um, there's this part of it where he, he talks about the uncanny as anything that, um, you know, was hidden or should be hidden, but comes to light. So there's this play with light in it. And um, a horror is all about playing with light in a sense. I mean, when we're talking about film, Nosferatu is an expressionist horror film, um, a German film. It was The whole thing was playing with light and shadow. And in a way, it doesn't have to be so literal. I mean, all horror film is, is dealing with light and shadow, but it can be like the, you know, what's known and not known, you know, uh, in that sense, like the metaphor of the shadow and what we don't know about a character. And oftentimes when we bring something to light or when the director brings something to light or the character discovers something, we end up bringing something to light about ourselves. And that to me is the mark of a really good horror film or horror story. And that's why the best, uh, well, I say I said Silent Hill too, but I'm going to back up on that. That's why the best horror product ever is Twin Peaks. <laughs> See, I haven't seen that. I need to. <laughs> Twin, okay. So just, just as a, a quick rundown, because yes, you would love it. Uh, Twin Peaks is about um, this, this weird little town in Washington where um, one day... The prom queen is found dead. And the FBI comes in to investigate. And what do you know? The prom queen uh, deals drugs. And there are weirdos in town. And uh, there's there's a lot of mystery and and, uh, personal uh, issues with all these characters and it's it's by the investigation into Laura Palmer's mis- like in her, into her murder that we mm-hmm. start discovering things about the town and we start seeing all the horrors and we start seeing all the great things about the town but mm-hmm. without that without that murder without that 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 almost uh generic um late 80s early 90s uh, uh gimmick you know the the prom queen's dead the the um what's what's the term for the the final girl i guess yeah the final girl yeah yeah 
um she's been found dead and what's what's she actually like what is her character like and we don't know that because we we can only discover more about her after she's she's been brutally killed so as as almost an encapsulation of all of those ideas twin peaks is like this this beautiful little meta fiction that that i think really does encapsulate a lot of what makes horror really really great yeah one thing about david lynch that i've learned um you know while i haven't seen twin peaks i've seen blue velvet which is whoo that's its own thing but i watched that um, with um with i mentioned him in all of our in all of our podcasts but uh the night manager philip that that lad um i watched that with him and his wife and i think his wife hates me now (laughs) It's, it's disturbing in its own way, mm-hmm. um, but Blue Velvet is, it's amazing. And what it tells us about like digging under the, the surface of, you know, the small town facade, um, that is something like the idea of the American dream and what, what goes into that. I, I'm, I've always been really interested in that. And Blue Velvet, and I think David Lynch just is so good at, at taking that and deconstructing that, that myth. Um, and I saw I saw the same thing in, in uh, Stephen King's It, um, where they take the small town sort of quaint charm and just totally disrupt it. And uh, that's one of the things that horror um, has really taken to task is some of the, you know, under undergirding myths of, of the country that maybe aren't like we don't speak to in as realistic of terms as we should. What is the cost of, of that, that um, vision of perfection? You know, like there's, there's the idea that these things look great and, and they might have a, a sparkle to them and, and they might appear to be perfect. But what was the cost to get there? Yeah, I mean, exactly. Yeah, what did we have to, who, who did we have to erase or, or exclude? And, you know, who potentially had to be exploited you know what tragedies had to be covered up yes yeah make it appear that way yeah one one short story this is um uh related but one short story for for anyone listening um and you're looking for like a good halloween short story um that deals with this theme of uh the you know deconstructing the american dream um, it's by Ray Bradbury, who is just a master at telling short stories. And it's called mm-hmm. The October Game. You can just Google it. There's a PDF that will pop up um, that you can read. It is so good. But it it takes the idea of the American dream in the 50s and just flips it on its head. And it's got a really, you know, kind of grisly twist at the end that's perfect for Halloween. It's, it's, it's set on Halloween. So if you're wanting something to read, that is a good one. It's short. It's like four or five pages. It's a great one. I, well, I, I haven't read it myself, news, guys, but we need to start wrapping it up. Okay. Well, yeah. I haven't read it myself, but I really want to read um, the, what's the, the, um, the Ray Bradbury. The October game. Oh, the October country. Uh, well, that one. No, I'm, I'm thinking of um, something wicked this way comes. Thank you. That's the one. Ooh, um, yeah. Yeah, that's that's one that's that that would be really great. Um, one of my favorite books ever is Dandelion Wine by mm. Ray Bradbury. Yeah, has one of the most horrific um, stalker short stories I've I think I've ever read, and it comes in the middle of this like idyllic, kind of like we were talking about the the um, the perfect small town, mm-hmm. and it's just it's right in the middle of the story, and it's so creepy and unnerving. Um, what what are some other good stories that we could that we could uh, recommend? Well, I'll just point out to you, Chris. If your favorite one of your favorite Red Bear Race stories is Daniel Lyon Wine, you will love something Wicked This Way comes because oh, it's yes. basically the same story told in the in in the autumn instead of the summer. Oh, yep, yep. Okay, you don't need to say any more than that. That's <laughs> I need to read that. Yeah, while we're talking about Ray Bradbury, the October Country is a really good one. Every time it gets to fall. I always read that because it has this uh, this story that starts the whole thing. It's just called October Country, but 
Ray Bradbury is great with poetic writing and it just captures the, you know, the autumn spirit perfectly. All right. Oh. If we're going to go with stories, let's, 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 some things, some reading stuff. Uh, the Haunting of Hill House, Shirley Jackson, one of the greatest yeah. horror stories of all time. The one that started it all, Frankenstein by uh, Mal- Mary Shelley. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going to throw out House of Leaves, which I, well, actually, I shouldn't throw that out because it's not really a story. It's just an experiment in deconstruction. You it? keep saying yeah. that, but there is a very clearly defined storyline happening in that book. <laughs> there, there are, are three five different storylines. Just because you focused on one of them doesn't mean it's, that's the complete novel. I I think there's plenty to be gained from reading House. I, I read House of Leaves in high school, and I got plenty out of it. Most Before people have seen the movie, to... but um, Silence of the Lambs, the book is just as good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, what else? Uh... I would say if you're looking for something that's pretty unique and has a very uh, unique vision, um, and it's a short story collection, so things you can kind of read in short 10, 15 minute spurts, Toy Box by it's a by al ser antonio he does such a good job of writing uh just really weird horror short stories that are also often set in the fall so if you want something that's good to read during the fall especially during the month of october that's a great one oh you know what i heard about this guy who was really inspired by silent hill who wrote a book of short stories that are like located in a in a town like it and i cannot remember the name of it right now but that's one that i'm that i've been looking at too that i would love to know what that one was well perfect um as a way we need to start wrapping up uh, as yeah. we all know um chris's definition of what makes a uh, good horror is um twin peaks uh Tony, <laughs> for you what makes good horror what's a good example of good horror A good example, I would say uh, my favorite horror film is It Follows. And I think it's a great example of horror all the way around. Perfect. And I'll throw mine out there. Uh, My favorite horror piece of art is probably uh, Peter Straub's Ghost Story. Ooh, that's a good one. Which uh, basically looks at the, the whole idea of the, of the ghost story of of the, of the, of the urban legend and how it, it, it can prey upon us. That's, That's not awesome. your favorite movie, though. We said piece of art, Chris. Yeah, piece of art. Yeah. That's oh, great. Right. Well, I, I have point out that the Twin the Peaks is a movie, times. but you're talking about the television show. And I've heard you talk about the thing so many times. There's also Silent Hill, too. So I like that we spanned <laughs> a lot of genres. This is good. Yes, uh, Silent Hill 2 is, is fantastic. I would like, I am actually thinking about streaming it soon. So that, that would be nice. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, I streamed Silent Hill 1 last year in the middle of May. Uh, <laughs> bad time for it. Yeah. Well, hey, thank you all for uh, inviting me on this podcast. This was uh, awesome to talk with both of you all, to talk shop about horror, no less. Um, you know, I always love doing this, and I'm super grateful that you all invite me to it. Oh, we're very happy to have you on, and we're we're gonna push this one up. We have a few more that we recorded uh, after the last one that we posted, but since mm-hmm. this is Halloween and we're trying to get in the spirit, you know, we're gonna we're gonna try to push this one up first. Sweet, great, that sounds good. Okay, well, thanks, all right, so. thank you so much for for coming on with us. I know it's a short notice and everything, but we really, really are are glad to have been able to sit down and talk about all this horror. Yeah, I was gonna say this was a lot of fun. Okay, well, uh, if if we can ever do another episode, um, I would love to, and we can just arrange another time, maybe next semester or something. Works for me. Great. All right. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Ryan. Right. It's good talking well. to you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. I'll talk to you all later. And for our listeners, thank you so much for listening. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. If you have anything that you would like to recommend or, or talk about, uh, we'd love to hear it. So thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Bye.